Welcome to The Stone Wolves, a Galactic Football League novella. Written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins. Performed by Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves is also available as a Kindle ebook from Amazon.com or as a full length audiobook from Audible.com. To find links for those items, go to scottsigler.com slash the stone wolves, one word. Hello, junkies. I recorded this episode very early, as when this episode drops, I will be in Florida hanging out with Coach and Ma Sigler. In fact, I recorded this episode right after the Super Bowl. I am thrilled that Matt Stafford got a Super Bowl title. He spent so many years getting the crap kicked out of him in Detroit. It was a great season of NFL football, especially the playoffs. The last seven games of the playoffs, including the Super Bowl, the best batch of playoff games I have ever seen. It was amazing. Now, if you missed out, my friend, do your own research and pick a team and dive in next year and join all of us in NFL fandom. It is a great time. Since I recorded this episode early, I don't know exactly where I am on GFL 7's second draft when you hear this, but I do know that I am very close to being finished. That's it for this week. Let's get you caught up on the story so far, then we're all going to go play in confetti. Previously on The Stone Wolves, on planet Rurgurk, the most dangerous place in the galaxy, the Oleran rendezvoused with Viden ship Diana Zero. Now, Viden must crack the code hidden in Redwire's blood, but is she still sane enough to get the job done? Find out next on The Stone Wolves, episode number 22. In a former life that had to be a century ago, Diana Zero had been a luxury yacht designed for some rich quiff leader. Honestly, why did everything the Stone Wolves dealt with have to be so old? Could it hurt them to buy some new stuff once in a while? Something at least made after Aya had been born? The weird old Haraz lab was in what had once been the yacht's master cabin. Whatever passed for quiff leader bedroom accoutrements, I wouldn't know she'd never been in a quiff leader's bedroom, were long gone, replaced by medical and scientific equipment. She hoped the cabin's repeating teal and cream circular design aesthetic, maroon shag carpeted walls, and brassy zigzag accents on the doorways, cabinets, and ceiling had come from the previous owner and were not Viden's design choices. Because there was crazy, and then there was crazy. Aya stood near a bulkhead, along with Skipper and Zan Schmeck, watching Viden work on Yitzhak Goldman, who was on his back on a multi-species medical table. The cabin had a dozen hollow tanks. Some were on the deck, some stuck out from walls, some hung down from the ceiling. When a sentient can hover in any position indefinitely, I supposed, there was no reason to have hollow tanks all rising up from the floor. Skipper was fifteen strata of Grumpy. I knew she'd pissed him off with a vote to help Goldman, but she also knew he would get over it. With seeing his old pals, one of which was Apex Bakuna, dealing with their convoluted backstories and the death of his old girlfriend, there was a lot of drama going on beneath those dreadlocks. That and the whole bomb that can destroy planets thing, of course. She could cut him some slack. Viden floated over to a terminal and activated it. As its holo projector booted up, she worked her way to one of the brassy wall cabinets, extracted a device no bigger than a gumdrop, and tossed it to Goldman. Without even sitting up, he caught it in midair. Goldman was fast. I wondered how well he knew Quentin Barnes. Maybe if everyone lived through this, Goldman could introduce her to Quentin. Put that sensor against your inner wrist, Viden said to Goldman, and make sure you lie still. I don't want this to be like the old times, when you whined about every little wound. Goldman laughed. I'm not fifteen anymore, Lulz. Do your work, I'll stay still. Wasn't the data stored in Goldman's DNA? In his blood? Why would he need to lie still? That wasn't how DNA worked. Was it? 
I had decided to stay quiet and not worry about it. It was a shame she couldn't talk about visiting Rurgurk on her next radcast. That was good content. But doing so would create a time-based connection point that might someday be used to connect Aya to Rara Avis. That would be problematic. Fanaka had figured it out, which was bad enough. What other secrets had that previously non-flattened woman possessed? Goldman remained perfectly still. He was a good-looking guy. A little pale for eyes, tastes, but wow, that body. Too bad he was married. With kids, even. Quentin Barnes was not married, though. A girl could always hope. The gumdrop device let out a beep. Viden floated over and plucked the device from Goldman's wrist, leaving a thin trail of skin-dust dandruff in her wake. Wow, did that sentient need to exfoliate? And also maybe change up her diet? I had never thought she'd smell anything worse than a dumpster full of decomposing Havanish intestines, but the stench of this ship proved otherwise. V then slipped the gumdrop into a notch on her terminal. The dozen holo tanks flared to yellow light life like glowing stalactites, stalagmites, and well, what did you call the kind that stuck out from walls? Did stalay whatever grow out of walls? It would be easy enough to look up once they were away from Rurgurk. The holo tanks all showed the same animated visual of a steadily filling progress bar. You can sit up now, Viden said. Goldman sat up. He slid off the table, stood, stared at the various holo tanks, one after the other. Hard to say how many good sentients died to get this data, he said. Aya wasn't sure how good those sentients were. They were terrorists, after all. As was Goldman himself, something she was having trouble keeping at the forefront of her thoughts. He seemed so... normal. Seemed like a nice guy. Smart. A family man. And yet, he was a high-ranking member of the Zoroastrian Guild. But that didn't matter for now. If there was a bomb that could kill an entire planet, and I had a chance to help stop that from happening, she was going to help. The progress bar finished its slow crawl. The holotanks lit up with strange glyphs, a written language Aya had never seen before. She saw scraps of one she did know, Sklorno Prima, the main key dialect, English. Was that a leaky cuneiform? It's a translation key she said. Goldman nodded as his eyes flicked from holotank to holotank. Agreed, he said. But for what? A shiver coursed through Viden's hollow body, kicking out another thin puff of dead skin. I already told you, she said. Facts are facts, whether you hear them or not. What? Did that old gas bag think the symbols were a language of the old ones? That didn't make any sense, nor did most of her rambling. Still, this translation key wasn't some conspiracy theory. It's a mathematical translation table, Aya said, and looks like some kind of engineering schematic, I think. But it's all broken up, bits and pieces, looks like. Goldman crossed his arms, nodded. As I understand it, what I was given is a partial information capture, he said. Two guild members lifted this from a Vermada transmission. This is all they managed to encode before they were found and killed. The translation sequence seemed to end. It was replaced by three-dimensional images. Some small, some large. They all looked alien, twisted, strange shapes. I've never seen anything like this, Skipper said. Prawa tech, maybe. Zan, how about you? The Schmeck stood stock still. It is not Prawat technology. It is all new to me. But with a math and engineering translation table, it seems logical those images are mechanical parts. Most likely to construct the bomb that Redwire discussed. I noticed that Zan called Goldman Redwire, same as Skipper did. Maybe that was a good idea. 
Yitzhak Goldman was an escaped imperial convict, whereas Redwire was a ghost. The image shifted. Several of the parts started to assemble into a bigger whole, with characters of that odd, unknown language flashing rapid fire. The image stuttered a few times, then faded into pulsing gibberish, the telltale sign of a computer trying to make heads or tails of incomplete data. Aya, Skipper said, could you make out any of that, from what you saw on the translation table? She stared, tried to piece it together, but after only a few seconds, she shook her head. I can't. Not with the partial key, she said. And the parts themselves assembling, looks like a blueprint to me, is also partial. Too much data is missing. Maybe Beans could make something of it? Skipper nodded. We should have brought him along. Someone had to stay home and mind the store. Vidan, can you make a copy of this for me? The hurrah didn't answer. Maybe because it was such an obvious thing to do. Skipper was like that sometimes, saying things that didn't really need to be said, asking for things that sentients already knew they needed to deliver. There's got to be more, Goldman said, an edge to his voice. Lulz, there's supposed to be a location. Yes, there's more, the hurrah said. Two sets of information. The first one, what is that annoying human phrase? Oh yes, I told you so. Till the stars shed the silicon and the gleaming eyes of those that were never born yet live forever fade away. I will not understand how you can be so stupid. Well, wasn't she a friendly sort? The those that were never born was another bit of old one's gibberish. But what did I know, anyway? She was just a Q Draco or whatever. The tanks flared and fluttered, showing another partial image. It seemed like a similar aesthetic style to the mysterious parts that had flashed up earlier, but it also looked familiar. Something I had seen before this moment, seen recently. Viden froze the image. I realized why she recognized it. So did Zan. That looks similar to the flat picture you showed us earlier, the Schmack said. The one of the... Zan trailed off. Aya understood why. She could barely breathe. The one of the probe that came from another galaxy, she said. The probe that was a transmitter. But that image we're looking at now is from the data in gold, I mean, in Redwire's DNA? No one spoke, and I knew why. No one wanted to acknowledge what Viden was showing them. It was obvious which meant it was Skipper's job to come out and say it. The Abernessia sent that probe, he said. And the Cruncher is of Abernessian design, which means the Vermada is working with the Abernessia. Was that possible? The Abernessia were not a conspiracy theory? Was the rumored invasion fleet actually real? That's how the Vermada came to power, Goldman said, sounding stunned as if it couldn't be real, but he knew it was. The gemstones. That's how the Abanessia funded them. And that's why the Vermada's mission is so much more violent, so much more chaotic than the original Zoroastrian guild. The Abanessia are using the Vermada to create conflict between governments to soften us all up for the coming invasion. I told you so. The Hurrah had been trying to tell everyone that the Vermada was working with the Abernessia? If she had just come out and said exactly that, would Aya have believed it? Aya didn't want to believe it. It was too terrifying a concept. We don't know for sure where that data came from, she said. This could be some kind of misinformation campaign. Goldman tore his gaze away from the holotanks, stared at Aya. Baconsfield played three seasons in Tier 2, he said. I recruited her myself. She broke a knee and had to retire, but she remained a dedicated guild member. Von Din Ru was 51 years old, still young for a key. They were the agents that got me this information. Goldman didn't sound like a nice family man anymore. He sounded like a cold-blooded predator, lying in wait to kill whatever came near. The Vermada caught them both, he said. I was told that Beaconsfield was slowly boiled alive, 
until her internal pressure caused his skin to split. They ate her. Von Din was skinned. They kept him alive long enough that he could see them turn his skin into a pair of boots. Then they fed him to Shushalix. So do I think this was a misinformation campaign? No, I do not. The jaw muscles beneath his bleach white skin twitched and flexed. As impossible as this is to believe, it connects the dots that have confused us for so long. An invasion fleet traveling across the impossible distances between galaxies? There had to be another explanation, because that wasn't how physics worked. That bastard, Skipper said, his words a hateful whisper. Thorn, he didn't just sell out the guild. He's selling out all sentience in the Milky Way. Skipper believed it too. Aya felt goosebumps ripple up and down her arms. Give me that data, Skipper said. I'll see what Beans can make of it. Goldman turned again to stare at the holotanks. First, the location, he said. It's got to be in there, Lulz. Find it. The hurrah's mouth flap wiped away a streak of snot leaking from a sensory pit, then tapped glowing icons in her display. The stalactite, stalagmite, and whatever might displays changed to a star map speckled with pale white dots representing thousands of stars. Aya saw the fuzzy, overlapping borders of an area claimed by the Planetary Union, the League of Planets, and the Hara Tribal Accord. In that overlapping area, a white star icon labeled CO-27. Vidan adjusted a setting, and a red dot appeared next to it, the text MT-734 glowing beneath. Longitude and latitude provided, Vidan said. If this stat is accurate, we have the exact location. MT-734 is one punch away, Goldman said. So close. That it was, an almost straight line coreward along the League Accord border. I had heard of MT-734. A punch mass planet, the Union, the League, and the Accord all claimed the world as sovereign territory. Yet there had never been any conflict over it. MT-734 was a demilitarized planet. No military craft allowed, apparently, by agreement of all three nations. That was because the planet wasn't worth fighting over, wasn't worth risking a skirmish that could start a war. MT-734 had no atmosphere, no permanent inhabitants, no natural resources that weren't far more plentiful and far less expensive to harvest elsewhere. It had massive deposits of a unique mineral called trilomite, but trilomite had no industrial use, and it was brittle and ugly, not even good for decorative purposes. The planet had never developed as a trade route punch point like Lopu, or even Gateway, for that matter. The Union and the League had Lopu as a go-between, so MT-734 was useless for trade between those governments. As for the highly active trade between the League and the Accord, Laura was a one-day punch from Newton Web Colony. MT-734 served no purposes there, either. And as far as trade between the Union and the Accord went, the route between Rieger II and Shora included lucrative stops in the Concordia's free station or even Quith itself. MT-734 had nothing going for it. Until now, it seemed. I'm seeing partial information on the facility, Vidan said. It is a civilian research facility trying to find commercial use for trilomite, a mineral in abundance on the planet. The facility is owned by Denisian Laboratories. A Vamada front, Goldman said. Or at least people in the ZG suspected as much. We could never prove anything. The Vamada is careful to not own anything, nothing that can be traced back to them. Lulz, tell me there's intel on the facility. The Hurrah's mouth flaps work the display. Partial information, she said. These appear to be hand-drawn sketches of the layout. There are some notes on staffing numbers, security suites, signal gathering, and communication protocols. But while this is not complete, it's far better intel than we had on many Cruzado missions. Goldman's eyes widened. He actually rubbed his hands together, like he was comically preparing for a meal. 
We have to go there, he said. Right now. Hit him right now. Skipper's face wrinkled up as if Goldman had kicked out a fart that was even worse than the yacht's existing stench. Hell no, Skipper said. Take my ship and crew to a secret Bermuda base. You just help yourselves to our lives, Red. Is that it? If you believe what you found, it's time to turn this over to the real authorities. Let the League or the Union handle this. Goldman wheeled on him. You haven't listened to a damn thing I've told you, he said. The Vermada are everywhere. They have plants in every government, especially the human ones. We send up the alarm. That alarm won't even reach the decision makers before it's disproved and labeled as just another conspiracy theory. Hell, the Abanesia already are a conspiracy theory. That bomb factory is one punch away, killer. We have to go there now, before they ship it off somewhere. Skipper sneered, shook his head. For all we know, they've already done that. We could be flying straight to our deaths, and— A klaxon blared inside Aya's head. Beans, pumping an alarm straight into her combud, followed by his high-pitched voice. Ship's incoming! Get back to— Bullets tore through the cabin, holes suddenly appearing in the ceiling and floor, kicking up sparks. Two holo tanks shattered, splashing still glowing fluid across the floor. The deck shuddered beneath her, she hit a bulkhead, and fell hard to the floor. The storm's roar filled her ears. The cabin lights went out, followed by the holo tanks, star maps fading as they dimmed to nothing. Aya heard the telltale squoosh of fill foam expanding and hardening, plugging the new holes. The stench of ammonia and sulfur stung her nose, drove into her throat. Aya had a moment to realize Diana's arrow had lost power, then the ship began to spin. Spin and drop, straight toward Rurgurk's acid ocean. You have been listening to The Stone Wolves, a GFL novella, written by Scott Sigler and J.C. Hutchins, performed by Scott Sigler. Follow Scott on Twitter and at Instagram, where he is at Scott Sigler, and on Facebook at facebook.com slash Scott Sigler. The Stone Wolves was directed by A. Sigler, engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2021 Empty Set Entertainment. Theme music is the song Battle Cry by the band Super Weapon. <laughs>